Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great research being done by folks who have used the historical collections held in the Hagley Library, especially scholars who have received funding from the Hagley Center. One such scholar joining me today is Dr. Megan Elias, Associate Professor and Director of the Program in Gastronomy at Boston University. And we'll be discussing her book project titled, Be His Guest, How Conrad Hilton Made Hotels Better Than Homes. Megan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, let's start by painting with broad strokes. Could you tell us what it is you're researching and writing about. Yes, um, so it is a biography of Conrad Hilton, but it is also a history of the hospitality industry in the 20th century. So the, um, the interest in the hospitality industry kind of came first. I usually write about food um, and food business is hospitality. So I, um, I began to be interested in, um, in hotels and specifically in how people um, in the business kind of conceptualized hotels and what are they and what do you need to know to run one? And I thought it would, it's such a huge subject that it might make sense to tell the story around an individual. And so I thought about, you know, who are the, who are the important names in this business and, and finding that, you know, Conrad Hilton didn't have a biography that was also about hospitality. There's one that's kind of about the the Hilton family and their scandals and and um you know the sort of like mostly focused on on their existence in Los Angeles but but um the story of the Hilton hotels is really a story of a you know a tiny company that grows and grows and grows and becomes international and establishes this whole concept of what American hospitality is and I hadn't, you know, I had not a clue that I would be thinking about these kinds of things. This really started with a little tiny book I was reading about how to run a lunch counter. Um, lunch counters were often part of, of hotels in, in the 1920s. And it just, you know, from the lunch counter, then I found there were other books about how to run your hotel. Um, and then, you know, finding this, this particular character who did have a global empire, um, has really made the project uh, much bigger than I than I thought it was going to be, which is fun, right? It's always fun. Oh, that sounds really fascinating. What is the time span we're talking about here? Yeah, so um, essentially late nineteenth century to late twentieth century. Yeah, so he's 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 about nine. He's ninety one when he dies. So he's got he's sort of like most of a century, which is like it's such a blessing for a historian, you know, because you're going <laughs> to think that way. Um, <laughs> And he's born in um, in New Mexico in a tiny town. So he's also part of the history of the you know the um, the settlement by uh, by European Americans of the West. So there's that like I'm actually working on this section right now. Um, he 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 embodies in his um, sort of per, in his public persona. He embodies the southwestern kind of cowboy figure. And then brings that spirit into his business life and his business persona too. So um, yeah, again, like the project he just it keeps bringing me into more and more corners of American history, and I have to kind of try to bring weave them together. Oh, well, how did Hilton get his start in the hospitality business? Ah, uh, so there are a lot of different stories about this. There's this sort of like apocryphal story about how his father ran a mercantile store. And they also rented out rooms. And so did, you know, did Hilton get his taste for hotels in this kind of not quite hotel, but sort of um, almost like boarding house situation? And he says no. Um, but it, it's true that like by the time he was an adult, he kind of knew a little bit about running hotels, you know, a hotel, um, <laughs> not really a hotel. But he, uh, he served in the First World War in the Quartermaster Corps. And that's the division that does all the supplies and moves stuff around. And so for me, I think that's where he began to get the idea of, of, of like, what is it like to be in charge of um, supplies in that way? Um, the Quartermaster Corps had a mobile laundry. They had a mobile repair shop. They had a mobile delousing station. <laughs> so he's already like in the pest control business <laughs> to some degree. 
Um, and all of these things are, are also things that you would also see in hotels. But he actually, he bought his first hotel when he was 32 years old. So he's already, you know, well advanced. Um, he'd been trying out a bunch of other things. He'd been trying banking. Um, he ran his sister's musical act for a while, which I also think kind of contributed because he's traveling, he's staying in hotels. He's already in that kind of inter entertainment business that hotels also um, are going to involve. Uh, but he bought his first hotel in 1919 in um, in um, Cisco, Texas. It was called the Mobley. It was a pretty new hotel. It wasn't fancy. Um, and he had, the story is he had gone to Mobley to try to buy a bank. The bank deal fell through. He went to the hotel and found that the hotel was just doing crazy business because they were, it was um, the middle of the oil boom. Mm. So um, he he said, okay, well, here's, a, here's, a, here's an interesting business, right? They're thriving. Um, I'll buy it, um, you know, as you do. <laughs> Right? You just drop into town and buy a hotel. <laughs> so it's, this is not a rags to riches story, right? As you can as you can tell already. Um, so he bought the first hotel in, in 1919 and then kind of quickly sold that one, but kept buying more and more and more. He built the empire um, in Texas to begin with. Um, and then um, almost got wiped out by the depression but really came back very strong. Um, and through the Second World War, he was very smart about buying hotels mm. uh, that people didn't really want, fixing them up a little bit, you know, um, and then and then uh, he just kept buying uh, until um, uh, in, in the post-war period, he began to uh, sort of be part of the Marshall Plan. Um, he, was, he was invited to help set up um american hotels in europe hmm. and you know so how does he get that how does he get that in that he's the person that they think can do this right how does and this is part of what i have to answer is how does he create a really convincing hotel chain in the u.s that makes officials in the u.s government think that he's the right person to to um set up american hotels in mm -hmm. in you know not just in europe but in parts of the world that have been kind of um disadvantaged by the war let's say mm -hmm. so that's well, to bring american dollars into those spaces mm -hmm. well what uh what was it about his model of um of hospitality that made him successful and uh, desirable as a partner with the government was it um scale the scale of his enterprise or uh, the, perhaps the standardization or, yeah or, there's there's a, a good a good bit of all of that so um, it's a kind of an idea of a, a standardized luxury. He's mm -hmm. building off of the, the um, Ellsworth Statler's idea, which was of um, a, a, a level of um, of cleanliness and convenience. Statler was really just trying to serve the um, the traveling businessman who um, really didn't need a lot in the way of like culture, but just needed a really clean, reliable place to stay. So he's he's building on that, but adding in the concept of um, of luxury. So standardized luxury, which is a very interesting oxymoron to to deal with. And part of what I was looking at the Hagley was this: how do you how does that manifest in interior design? Right? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Feel like? Smell like? Um, so what is the sensory experience of standardized um, elegance? But also, um, he had worked out a, a, a business model that was unique at the time not so much now but he he sold a management system basically so your your country pays for the building and um hilton sells you the the idea of how to run it and mm -hmm. the, and trains the staff and so there'll be a couple of hilton people working in your hotel but there'll be a lot of local staff and they will have learned this business so in in some way it's a really neat um way for a, a country to <laughs> to sort of jump into American style um, hospitality. Is, is that sort of a franchise uh, it's approach? It's kind of like a franchise, but not exactly, because Hilton still retains, um, uh, hard to, it's hard, this is, I got art, I have to articulate the difference here. I don't, I can't do it yet. Okay, sure. Um, well, uh, what collections at the Hagley Library did you jump into to help you uncover this story. Yeah, so the big collection there for me um, was the was the William Paulman collection. 
Mm-hmm. And so he was an interior designer who had been hired by Hilton to work on the um, Rockefeller Center Hilton, which is, is the, it's a whole building like built from the ground up. It's um, interesting looking. It doesn't look, it didn't look like the other buildings around it at the time. So it's a, it's a big statement. And you put something like that in New York, right? You're really making a statement that I am here. And I'm like, I'm the biggest guy in town. He'd also, um, he bought the the plaza, he bought the Waldorf, like he bought the, you know, the signature hotels of New York, but then he needed to, to really build um, something special to Hilton. Hmm. And Hilton, um, the company had a an, an kind of inside design team, but they also often worked with um, designers who were not on their team. So architects and interior designers, um, and then also decorators who are not exactly from their team. So I wanted to, to understand how um, how the space is created, what are the values that the company is thinking about when they hire someone to create space, and what's the interaction with the individual designer? How, does the, how much does the designer get to speak his language or her language, and how much is it a Hilton language? Hmm. So I've got this a bit, this obsession with the um, Roman Marchand book of creating the corporate soul. And so trying to figure out what the Hilton corporate soul is through design elements. And then because I'm a food historian, <laughs> through the culinary. Um, and so how does William Palman, how much does he contribute to what the, the voice of Hilton is? And how much does the voice of Hilton sort of become a Palman voice uh, in this case? And there's also some, some material about hotels in the Ernest Dichter collection. Um, which is the market, you know, the amazing market research collection. Less than I wish. I, I really want to go back in time and tell Ernest Dichter to pay more attention to hotels because I need to know. <laughs> yeah. But um, I could probably use my time machine for, you know, solving world peace or something. Instead. Well, what did you find? Um, uh, it, what's the balance between these uh, different impulses uh, for designing uh, these spaces uh, was it primarily um, Hilton driven, or did designers have some autonomy in in shaping these spaces? What was the balance there? Yeah, it was really interesting. Palman had a lot of freedom, hmm. so getting to read his letters to the Hilton people, their letters to him, his letters to other designers who he's working with. So he'll have the vision, and then he'll also work with textile people, lighting people, furniture people. So Palman had this whole community of designers and makers mm. um, that I would just love to write more about and learn more about. So um, he he was able to have a lot of freedom in choosing, in buying things. He bought a lot of art. Um, there's, there's, I think probably today there would be tons more oversight, mm. but he's able to just buy things and say, this is what I want to put in here. I bought it. Now can you pay for it? And there's very little pushback mm. about what he's bought. There's some some um, cabinets that are, or maybe they used to be altars, but they've been turned into cabinets. Um, and there, there's a little bit of pushback, like, this is very expensive. Why did you get this? And then he just explains, like, it's, it's all this mood I'm trying to create. And if you don't want that, you don't really know it's classy. Um, <laughs> so Palman was really, Palman was so sure of himself. And that's another thing that you just, you it's really hard to imagine anyone getting into this this collection and not just wanting to spend all their time there because Palman was creative, funny, um, and really certain of his style, which was this um, this style that I know I'd seen a million times and I had no idea that it came from a person and then it had a name, um, but it's this eclectic modernism mm-hmm. where it's, it's so American. You just get to do what you want. You take things from all different eras and places and all different colors and you just throw them together, right? You have, you don't have to be consistent to any culture. You don't have to like respect anybody else's rules. It's just play and have fun. Um, and so just seeing that, right? Seeing Palman's sense of, of, of it, it's like you're entitled to all of the cultures of the world. In the early 1960s, in the U.S., right, in a Hilton hotel, and Hilton hotels are themselves um, a kind of a global, you know, sort of part of, like, cultural colonialism of the U.S., 
and so it all it all just like began to make much more sense um and it it makes it so that I can really I feel like I can really convey to a reader um not just like what are the colors that you see walking into the lobby or into this um this dining space which I'll tell you about but what are what are the messages right what does it mean for you to see that ancient Chinese altar turned into a side table. What is what is Palman and what is Hilton telling you about the world and your place in it as an American? Is it meant to imply that you as uh, the uh, the Hilton customer at the pinnacle of of a of a world hierarchy? I think so. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's something you buy, right? It's your it's part of the experience that you buy as a guest is um, you know, I'm not just here in New York. I'm in the Hilton world. Right? Mm, well, yeah, I can see how that would be seductive as a as a to the consumer and also appealing as um, from the business perspective as well uh, as yeah. a, an effective marketing tool, a way to sell your service. Right, right, and then it, and that just perpetuates itself, right? So then the American is like, well, I'm you know, I'm entitled to all these things. All this is mine. Mm -hmm. Well, where does food come into the picture? Of course, it's it's central to the hospitality and the service industry more generally. Yeah. Um, and, and so how does that enter your study? Yeah, so this, there's probably somebody else needs to write a whole book about hotel restaurants um, because they're essential, right? You have to feed your guests and yet they're always the least desirable restaurant, right? There's something about, well, if it's in a hotel, it's not there for the same reason as a restaurant that's not in a hotel. Hmm. that it's there because of function um, and not because of some kind of impulse, some creative impulse. Um, but what Palman does in, in the Rockefeller Center Hilton is creates a whole street of restaurants. So it's called the Rue des Gourmets. Um, and it is an, an, a hallway, basically, with restaurants off of it. But it's supposed to, it's again, it's supposed to give the guests this idea that they're not just in New York, they're, they're suddenly almost like, it's almost like the hotel is this portal to all kinds of other parts of the world. Well, okay, I shouldn't say all kinds of other parts, Europe, <laughs> mostly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the, the Rue des Gourmets was really interesting to me. I had no idea that it was going to, you know, that I would find out so much about it. Um, the, the concepts of what the restaurants should be about change through the project. So there's something very uh, interesting about how he could just switch from, oh, it's going to be an Alsatian restaurant to it's going to be um, a restaurant from New Orleans. It doesn't matter in some way what the food is. It's just that there has to be a range of cu cuisines represented and stories in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be, you know, it could be six of any dozen places or stories um and that, that really interested me that there's there's not a commitment to a particular food ways there's just the commitment to variety to you you know you get to choose are you roman tonight or are you um are you feeling like a french bistro and it just is up to you right it's there's nothing there's no obligation to be authentic to anything right and well, so this, the, yeah. these restaurants are um, designed, Palman keeps changing the designs and finding new materials. Um, and they're, all of the conversation is about the design. It's all about the look and there's not a word about food in the whole correspondence, nothing about, you know, there's sketches of the menu so that we can see the design of the menu. Oh, is this pretty, is this not pretty? But not, not discussion of what, what we're gonna eat that's completely left up to the Hilton chef. Well, that seems like a pretty, um, uh, a loud silence yes. there. What does that say to you? Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it, this is intriguing. It, it, I think it has to do with this, um, this kind of international cuisine that's, um, really dominant at the, at that time in the early 1960s in, um, in American culture, and then it's like it's exported through the Hilton hotels, um, and it's uh, it has it definitely has its own rules. It's it's somewhat multicultural, 
in that it grabs from different cultures, a dish here and a dish there. Um, but it's got, it's got some consistencies that I'm really still kind of working on. And that'll be, that's something that I'll definitely you know, work, want to be presenting on later. Um, but it, the thing that I discovered while looking at all of the designs, I was thinking about when you walk down the Rue des Gourmets, what does it smell like? Or do you smell Italy? Then you smell France? Then you smell New Orleans? And it dawned on me that as I was looking at the menus, that there were a lot of dishes that overlapped. So there's a dish, there's, there would be dishes that were on all four menus. And I was like, what's going on here, right? How's this happening? And then looking at the drawings again and realizing that the restaurant spaces are just the dining spaces and there's no kitchen. And then on a blueprint, finding that there's a common kitchen. So when you walk down the Rue des Gourmet, you're actually not smelling any cooking probably. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Just because just the smells that come from individual servings are not going to be enough to create that ambiance. And mm -hmm. oh, so interesting. Right. How are you supposed to think that you're in Rome if you don't smell Rome? Mm -hmm. you, know, you just smell this sort of maybe this kind of low level institutional cooking smell. <laughs> it's just it's so hard to, you know, it's so hard to figure out what the experience was like for people. Um without you know without those kinds of details right what is mm -hmm. the scent what brings you into the roman place instead of the place that's supposed to look like a bordello in, in new orleans and mm -hmm. why bordello i mean that that's a whole other conversation was, was this the uh, the hotel kitchen then that is simply serving to different uh, sitting areas or uh, dining yes. areas hmm. yeah i mean it's a, it's a kitchen sort of dedicated for these restaurants mm. okay um and there will be, there's different, um, there's usually a coffee shop in every, most American hotels have a coffee shop too, which means like a, sort of more like a diner, you know, grilled cheese sandwich, coffee, milkshake, hamburger. Hmm. But that's a different well, kitchen. Well, it sounds uh, like the, um, the design uh, philosophy is being reflected in the food and so far as you said it's there's this eclectic modernism is a pastiche of uh, different things grabbed from elsewhere or that don't need to make sense uh, side by side but that's sort of the point right exactly yes yeah exactly that's, so that's all of really... that is it's very different from what we expect now right where people mm -hmm. are sort of hunting for authenticity that wasn't the concern mm-hmm and so did uh, the Hilton chain continue to grow? Well, what is the trajectory here from the, the mid 20th century? Yeah, um, so this is really, this is 1963. So this is just about the end of the time that I'm thinking about. He really retired mm -hmm. in 1966. And um, the international division gets sold off um, to TWA. So there's still a Hilton um, involvement, but there's also this, there's also TWA. Right. And the TWA records have been, I, I can't find them <laughs> essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody else who's working on a Hilton project also can't. <laughs> so it's some way you have to end this. Um, you know, if you're looking at Hilton and design and hospitality um, until those, those, you know, those papers can be found. Um, this is where that con that conversation between Hilton and designers is really kind of beginning to end. Mm -hmm. um, so he, I mean, I think he, when he dies, the company's, it's in a transition. It's he's given it to his sons. He's not that confident of, um, in fact, when he died, he didn't leave very much to them and they had to, didn't have to, but they did contest the will and get, sort of get what they thought was their fair share. So he's, he's, at the end, he's, I think unsure of what the future of his company is going to be. He tied it up so much with himself um, and this kind of, it's so, it's hard to describe what he's like as a leader, but he's very um, easygoing. So like the, those, the fact that Paulman had so much freedom mm -hmm. to create his designs the way he wanted to, to create a feel and space for the Hilton, um, that's, it seems very much in keeping with earlier 
correspondence I've read between Hilton and um, other people in his company that's sort of like, well, you know what to do, you know, um, you'll figure it out and just report back to me and let me know and I'll just, I'll figure out the money. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of refreshing. <laughs> this is very low, low level of involvement and yet an enormous amount of money is being made and he's got his name all over the world. But you'd think someone who wanted their name all over the world would be really like domineering and it just doesn't come across in the, in how he deals with people. It's funny. It's a funny balance. I'd like to come back to the title of your project. Uh, how is it that uh, these this hotel chain became better than home? And what do you mean by that? I guess more to the point. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's this long history of hotels where for most of most of the time that they've existed, they've been kind of necessary evils. Mm -hmm. um, which I think it's hard for a contemporary person to to imagine. But you know, if you think about um, Moby Dick, right? You get a room, somebody else is in the bed, uh, you deal with it, right? Um, there are fleas, maybe you get a bowl of chowder, right? Um, and then it it's er, kind of early 20th century that it becomes an industry, that hospitality becomes something that you can sell um, and that you can sell people an experience that's something that, that they want. Mm -hmm. So it was a place you had to go. So home was always better than a hotel. And then it becomes a place that... Um, because because people recognize the desire for um, for experience, um, how do you say this for um, for being taken care of, right? Mm. That whole the service industry, right? That the whole philosophy of um, I can pay somebody else to um, make me feel comfortable, to make me feel special, and I don't have to give them anything in return except for money, right? It's not it's no accident that hotels are also um, places where sex workers are very successful, right? Because it's a place where you are, you're going to be rendered services that typically you would get in the home and there would be some kind of emotional exchange, which no longer, you no longer have to deal with. So uh, hotels become, um, as hotel owners, as, ho as, as people, uh, men who own hotels, all in, almost always men, um, begin to kind of collect hotels and decide, um, on kind of like what we now think of as like a brand, right? What does it, what does it mean to stay in a, you know, an American hotel company hotel? What does it mean to stay in a, Hil in a Hilton? How do they distinguish themselves from other chains and other hotels? They're competing with each other to offer folks stuff that they don't have at home, mm -hmm. that they don't have in other hotels. Um, and they, the hotel owners even begin to talk about themselves as setting design standards. So I don't know that it's really true, but they say to each other, right? When we buy furniture, like we, we you know, when people stay in our hotel, they see our furniture. And then when they go home, they want to buy furniture like that. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that, but it's something they believed in. So they believe that they're um, creating mm -hmm. experiences that are good enough to pay for, right? Mm -hmm. Because really all you need is a place to sleep. But they, they have now, like we now, I think, think of hotels as, um, it's a place of freedom, right? I can be somebody else there. Um, I can, you know, I can be a bit more kind of lordly <laughs> and I can get away with at home. Um, and so the, that, that it really, my, that subtitle, um, which I have to give my friend Kathy Feely credit for, because she, she framed it for me, um, was the, the, the idea that um, sort of coming out of this long history of the necessary evil into the desirable, um, you know, the treat. And uh, I guess uh, to bring it back to the eclecticism of design, it, that fits perfectly into that uh, that pattern because, um, well, people don't have, uh, as you say, uh, Chinese shrines turned into sideboards in their homes, uh, yeah. but might feel um, themselves elevated uh, by to pay for the experience to be exposed to these um, sort of finer things, as it were. You're right. Yeah, that's what he's, um, that's what, you know, what Paulman can offer them is, uh, is this, this mix that they probably can't afford to do themselves, that they don't have the expertise, the buyers, right? They don't have the connections to make for themselves. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, the, to make those, there's very modern American spaces. Um, they may not have the courage to do that. Mm -hmm. And he's definitely, oh, he had the courage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Megan, thank you so much for sharing this uh, with me. And I can't wait to read the book. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> I have a reader. <laughs> <laughs> I think there will be several. I think we'll be lining up. Um, and, uh, to the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, and the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>